quick prayer here. Um, Father God, we thank you so much, Lord, for everything that you do for us, Lord. Your uh, grace and your, your presence is, is just uh, absolutely amazing. Just everything that you do, the way you bless us, the way you bless this church, Lord, the way we can have community, the way we can love, talk, and celebrate you, Lord. We just, everything that you do is just glorious, and we just want to glorify your name. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. I just have a couple uh, announcements. Um, first, our family dinner, our taco night was so much fun. We had a bunch of families. We ate tacos and the kids ran around like crazy maniacs and it was a blast. We have a bit of a recap video. Yeah, and huge, huge thank you to everyone who served as well. That was amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank Couldn't you <laughs> no, it was it was so much fun. We had a blast. Yeah. Next up, next Sunday, uh, Teen Challenge is coming here. I don't know if that's up there. Um, this is a really amazing program, and there we're excited to come together as a church to support them financially as well. So there are some ways to give. Um, up there, but I'm pretty sure all the normal ways, online and you just free will, free will oh, it's a free will offering too? Okay. So that's next Sunday. That's exciting. February 1st, our glow night. Um, we're just having some kids here and we're going to set up the black lights and have some games and crafts and all that. So it's going to be fun. Hmm? Oh, man. And then junior high is on Wednesday, and uh, this Wednesday. And then one last one for our encounter night, which is happening um, February 5th at 6.30. Uh, Glad Tidings Worship Band is going to come here. And it's last time they were here, it was so, so good. So everyone, please come out to that. It's going to be amazing. Oh, 6.30. 6.30. Right, Dave? Is it 6.30, I think? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's 6.30. Also, guys, I want to touch base with the men in the group. Um, we are doing our, our men's Bible group on Thursdays at 7.30. Dave runs a great show. Uh, we've got a, a lot of good people that are all there. Um, and we're just finishing up the book of Jonah. I don't think this is the end. I'm sure we're going to keep on going with this, Dave. So uh, we encourage any men that uh, want to come out and meet with us on Thursdays. Uh, we got a great group going, and it could only get better if the more people come. So, thanks so much. Well, we may not be the Glad Tidings worship band, but this is us. So, come on, stand up. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Go ahead, Julia. Oh, Julia needs a second because she's going to start. Okay. <clears throat> she's almost hooked up. She's getting there. She's still hooking up. Why does one of the lights go off?
sound of his voice. Sheaves that are shaken and stirred and calmed and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, You want to pray with us today? Thank you. I'm so thankful that God is here with us today and he's waiting to meet your needs as you come to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us so much, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for whatever our needs are, Lord. Father, I just pray that you would just 
be with us today as we worship you, Lord, and you would bless, bless us as we hear your word, that everyone would be touched by it, Lord, and that we would grow strong in our faith. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Awesome, thank you. We will have some, uh, Joanna, will you be in the prayer room? Yes, awesome. So we're, we're just about to go for break, uh, just a quick 10-minute break. Um, kids are going to go upstairs. Uh, prayer room is available down the hall at the end. And Michelle is not here. As you can see, she's home recovering from uh, her foot surgery. So Karen is here today to do um, a presentation for like a mental health presentation, which should be amazing. So that is it. Uh, kids, you are welcome to come with me upstairs and enjoy the break. Enjoy coffee. Connect with someone.
for someone to pull the group together after the 10 minutes because it seemed like a long 10 minutes and I thought, duh, I think that's me. So could you please bring your coffee and your, um, whoever you're speaking with and come and have your seat again and we'll talk about uh, mental health today if you'll engage with me. A few weeks ago, uh, Michelle emailed me and wondered if I might consider speaking about mental health. It's Bell Let's Talk Day on January 25th, and it's a good opportunity to highlight the challenges with mental health, which are considered globally, and Canada is not excluded, a crisis right now. There's almost no families that are not touched by mental health challenges. It's so common, we've become to see it almost as normal. And I think, as faith groups, we need to stand up and support those who are facing these challenges. Whether it's the person themselves or those that love them, it's really, really a challenging um, journey through mental health. It's not a quick fix. It doesn't go away quickly. And those who've been through it, who are going through it, I think often feel alone and isolated. I have intimate experience for at least 25 years with mental health issues. Three of my three children have suffered terribly with depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. I know this path more than I ever thought I would want to. Um, <clears throat> my, my daughter, the youngest one, um, I was a little bit more informed and I understood a little bit more. And as she was walking through this, she had a life-threatening depression which lasted well over 10 years and I remember arguing with her one day about her mood and I said you have to talk to me and she stormed off into her room and I went after her and she was pacing back and forth and she started ripping up a notebook just a page out of it and she was ripping it up and she just threw everything all the, pa all the pieces on the floor. And I said, stop doing that. And she said, you asked me to talk about this. You asked me how I feel. That's how I feel. You see if you can make sense out of it. And I thought, oh, that's really, really descriptive. And I think through all of the challenges I've gone through, it really makes you feel alone. There's a fear that if you were a better parent, your children would, wouldn't be going through this. And you feel like there's not that many other people walking the same walk. And it's hard to find people to talk with to support you. And I think for faith, it's a time when you feel somewhat disconnected from God, but when you most need him. I remember just a couple weeks ago, actually, my middle son suffers terribly with anxiety and depression, and he's been troubled with alcohol abuse, and he's, in his, he's almost 40 now, and part of me thinks, I guess this is just his life. He's unable to work. Um, his mind is all scattered, and it's really hard for a parent to watch, and I think maybe I just have to accept that that's the best he can do. And every day I'm thankful that God has still got him in his protection because it's just by the grace of God that he's alive. But I got this flash vision a couple weeks ago, and it was just a vision of my son. He was dressed nicely. His posture was good, confident, and he was just on his way. He was better. And I, it's just stopped me dead in my tracks. And I thought, yes, yes. Oh, thank you, God. This is a possibility. 
this is still a possibility. Thank you, thank you, I needed that. And so I told, I told Nick that too. And I, I think it infused hope, for me it did, and for him too. So sometimes even when you forget to reach out, even when you, you think that things aren't gonna get better, holding on to God is what you need to get you through. And as a faith group, I want to challenge us as a community church family to do what we can to support individuals and families going through this challenge. There's a video, it'll be about 35 minutes if you could watch that. And I would encourage everyone to um, fill out the survey. If you don't do it in the paper form, please do it online. Um, we want to get a sense about what the needs might be. Is it you that needs help? Is it a family member? It would change what we might do. And there is no plan, but for those who might like to talk about how we might better support people who are troubled with mental health issues, uh, stay tuned. We'll see what, uh, what we come up with, because I know when great minds come together, great solutions, or at least an opportunity for doing better will be um, explored. So if you um, could please fill out the forms and I'll just step aside and we'll watch the video. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Before we dive in, uh, I need to take, we are seeing a number of trains departing from Qualification Station right now, so I'm going to offer a few of those trains to you. Number one, I am not a health, mental health um, expert, okay? I, I don't have a degree in, uh, you know, as a psychologist or even as a counselor. I'm a student of the Bible. I have a degree in theology. And so I'm not coming up here claiming that, that I'm an expert on the subject, but I believe that there is something that we can hear from the Lord about in this. So I need to get that off to you right to start, okay? So that's me. Um, there's usually two camps when it comes to this issue. This is the other qualifier. And that is people will say, well, mental health isn't the word, isn't in the Bible, and so we really shouldn't talk about it at all because it's not there. And the other side of it is people will say that we should only appear, appeal to the Bible as the thing that informs everything mental health. And I would just simply say that I'm taking a middle-of-the-road way. I am, I'm saying that, that the Bible does have something to say about it. Um, even though the words mental health are, are not used explicitly in the Scriptures. And I would also offer that there are things that, that, is a, that are around us, there are professionals that can be helpful to people because they call it the doctrine of the common grace of God, that God can use people who are educated that can be of help to you when it comes to things like mental health. So I'm taking that middle of the road uh, way in this. The last qualification I want to give is to again say that this is a massive topic where on one side of the spectrum you can have someone who has occasional bouts of anxiety or they get some dark times and depression all the way to having some severe issues of schizophrenia it can be personality disorders and even suicidal thoughts. So you can tell this is, this is a massive topic. I might take two sermons on this one. 
maybe three. I could do a whole sermon series on this, really, but I'm going to take two for sure. But I want to appeal mostly on the level, on the side of the spectrum that is to that area where many of us, maybe in this room, currently are struggling with. I have no doubt, and the statistics will show us, that there are more than a couple people in this room that are struggling with mental health. So, qualification station, the trains have departed, let's get going, okay? So let me, let me pray for us. Lord, we give you this time, this, this series to you. I just love your word, and I love that it has something good to give us, the people of God, and yes, even the world. The world can benefit, so Holy Spirit, come. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. So let me rattle off the stats to you. These are not uncommon. You can go on Google, but I'll share them anyway. Um, one in three Canadians, about 9.1 million people, will be affected by a mental health illness in their lifetime. One in every seven every year, so that's 15%, uh, 15% of Canadians use health services for a mental illness. So that's close to 5.5 million Canadians avail themselves of services, so that is more than the population of British Columbia. Mental health, just a definition, includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, how we feel, and how we act. How we think, feel, and act. So what I would like to do is, is talk about the issues and then some ways forward. Okay, so that's really important because the Bible, the Bible says both. Let me say that the Bible is the most crystal clear book you can read about people's struggle with mental health. It is so starkly honest as you probe into this. Like, I imagine pulling one of the characters out of the Bible and plunking them into a clinical psychologist room where the psychologist can interview them. I just imagine it going down. You know, you see a character coming in. Hi there. Uh, it, see, it, it looks like it says your name is um, King David. Yes, that's right. What brings you by, uh, King David? Um, I'm not doing very well. I'm actually a really big hot mess right now. I'm really sorry to hear that. Can you tell me what's going on in your life? Well, I process some of the difficulties in my mental health through poetry. Here it is. <laughs> okay, let's read. Um, okay, my soul is cast down within me. My tears have been my food day and night. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Wow. Um, this is really uh, intense, King David. Yeah, there's more. Well, that'll be enough for now. Why don't you fill out this form? It's, it's called a Beck's Depression Inventory. Because I think that you are probably um, clinically depressed, and we'd like to give you help. The Bible is very, very clear. In fact, I would say that you could almost give a, a subtitle to the Bible. It's, it's the story of God with people with broken dreams, dashed hopes, severe mental and emotional anguish. It's real. It's right in front of us. Let me just say the first point I'd like to give to you is that our bodies ain't right. They're not right. And we can say that because of the fall. See, back with, our, with humanity's parents, Adam and Eve, when they chose to say, my way, not God's way, that thrust them into a tumultuous time whereby Everything that the fall, the implications of it, touched every part of the human person. That means their bodies, their mental health, everything. Everything has been impacted by the fall. And so, one of the ways we can look at this is that 
our bodies, which affect our mental health, are prone to weakness. First Kings, I'd like to read the story of Elijah. It's really intriguing. We have it there. So Elijah is on the run. And this is what it says. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he laid down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and he ate and drank and went in the strength of that food, 40 days and 40 nights, to Horeb, the mount of God. So the story of Elijah, he performs this miraculous display, and he runs basically a marathon to Jezreel, where he encounters a murderous queen and Jezebel wanting to take his life. And what does he do? He panics. He takes off. And he gets to a place where he is completely exhausted, depleted of all resources. He is hungry. He is despairing. And God meets him. And God says, through the angel, essentially, the reason why you are suicidal, because that's what this is. The man is so desperately in a rough place that he's, he's thinking of taking his own life. Have you ever been there? There are people that have been there, and, and many of you in those dark moments maybe have said, I wish I wasn't around anymore. And so what the angel does is, doesn't say you should pray more, Elijah. <laughs> you really should get your act together. It says the reason why you're a mess is because you just need to eat. Like, get, some, get your blood sugars up. Here's something to drink. Why don't you have a nap? In fact, do it twice. Christians feel guilty because they take naps. Take a nap if you're tired. You get permission from your pastor. Because that's how the Lord restores people. We are frail, fragile people. And God has ordained it that we need to have that rest and replenishment. So God gives that to Elijah. And it becomes incredibly beneficial for him. And these are the common graces that God gives to us. And yes, I would also add that there are advances in medicine. Whether it be you have a vitamin deficiency. Just take some vitamin C. Or whether you might need something a little bit more. (laughs) That medications can be of good help to people. Depending on your circumstances. Our bodies aren't right. You know, some of us, if you've taken a Myers-Briggs test or an ISFP, which basically means, if you don't know what those letters mean, neither do I. But I know this. It means that you are probably very emotionally sensitive. And if you're emotionally sensitive, it means you're probably more prone to anxiety and to depression. Um, I'm going to invite, I've asked my wife to come up and just share just very, very briefly some of, of her story because uh, this, was, this was part of her journey, our journey as a family And I think it expresses a little bit about this idea of of the challenges that that we can face at times. So I'm going to let you go ahead and share a little bit. Hello. Hi. Good morning. So back in, um, it was March of 2015, I had a 10-month-old baby and a 3-year-old and a 4-year-old. And... I started experiencing what I refer to later as like blips on a radar, little warning signals that things were not doing great in my brain. So things like 
I was in the superstore parking lot and I couldn't find a parking space close to the door and had my baby with me and it was raining and I just could not figure out a way of how I was going to get my baby in the grocery store, get the groceries and get back out to my car if I had to walk through the rain. So I just left. I just couldn't do it. Went back to my mom's house because I couldn't figure it out. Or my husband was really busy in a busy season of ministry and um, I just would panic at the thought of being at home alone with the kids. I would usually get in the car and just drive out again to my mom and dad's house and need help with that. Um, it got to a point where it was compounded because my 10-month-old baby was waking up every 45 minutes throughout the night. So I was not sleeping. And we went on a little family getaway to visit some friends in Cochrane, Alberta, which is just outside of Calgary. And that was also the season when ISIS was really in the news. They were gaining ground in the Middle East, and it was to a point where I couldn't actually watch the news anymore because it was affecting me so deeply. And we walked into the McDonald's in Cochrane after church on Sunday morning. Again, I'm already not doing great, and I see on the screen ISIS hit list found West Edmonton Mall on the list, essentially. And West Edmonton Mall was a safe space for my family. We went there all the time. We spent time there with our kids. And I could feel my body reacting in that moment. I became nauseated. I couldn't eat anymore. Um, any sense of wanting to sleep was gone because I honestly feel like my brain just broke in that minute. It was not, I was no longer able to process things in a rational and healthy way. So where um, I had in the past, been able to talk myself down from the situations, I couldn't do it anymore. So we went from Cochrane out to Canmore, right near Banff, and I remember sitting in the passenger seat of the van, just closing my eyes and saying, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? Over and over and over again, and just seeking comfort, knowing that the Lord was with me, even in the midst of it. Um, we got out to Canmore, and unfortunately, things did not get better. Um, I continued down the path of thinking, this is all really nice, but soon ISIS will be here, and our life, as we know it, will be over, and just not seeing a way out. So, through prayer, through calling people that I knew were godly and I trusted, um, I had one lady who's probably one of the most godly people I know, she's also a nurse, pray with me over the phone and say, Anna, if this doesn't get better, there's medication that can help you. So we went home, and I think the day we got home, Gord tried to go to work, and I remember just clinging to him and crying and saying, you can't leave me, you cannot leave me. So we went to the doctor, and uh, I remember he looked at Gordon and said, okay, you're sleep training your daughter tonight. <laughs> and so that your wife can sleep, and he put me on medication. And there was no shame in the medication because my brain was broken and it needed help. Just like if I were to break my arm or if my pancreas was not working properly and I had diabetes and I needed some medication for that, my brain needed help. So it also started me down a journey of, um, I would say mental healing in that there were things that God needed to unravel in my brain of things that I had believed for a long time that just weren't true, whether it was about him, about me as a person, whatever. He used that to, to and that season to heal those things deep inside of me. I started going to a really great counselor. It's an older gentleman named Dr. Stan, and uh, he just had really good wisdom for me, things that I needed to learn how to do. So uh, we are seven and a half years past that, I guess. Uh, I'm still on medication. And I was recently at a medical uh, appointment, and they always ask, you know, are you on any medications? And I said, yeah, I'm on Ciprolex. And they said, what's that for? And I said, it's an anti-anxiety medication. And uh, this person is a Christian and said, oh, don't you know Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7? And I said, oh, yes, I'm actually very well aware of those verses. 
<laughs> do, you know, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This isn't a matter of me not trusting God. It's my brain needs help to work properly. And it doesn't mean that I'm not trusting him in the midst of it. It doesn't mean that I don't have enough faith. It's just I have an imbalance in my head. Yeah. So that's great. There you Thank go. you. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. All right. Okay, just some honest talk. So we're talking about the fra- the fragility of the the human body and um that there are ex- circumstances that can wreak havoc on it. And God has given these graces to us, common graces to help us. So th- there's a challenge with our bodies, but our bodies ain't right. But at the same time, it's not just simply that. What can cause mental health challenges are also that our relationship with God ain't right at times. So the story of the Bible is that our bodies fail us, but also as a result of the fall, our very identity has been thrown out of whack. When you have, and just listen to the cries of the world around us, who am I? What is life even for? What is my purpose? You have individuals who ask questions like that, that don't have satisfactory answers. That will plague on your mental health. Just a little quick word about my story. In my late teens and early 20s, I, I went into a depression as well. And it was, it was, it was a season where my, my friends and my family couldn't figure me out. My mom would say, what is wrong with you? Like, you, you were always such a happy kid. And it was more than me just being a brooding teenager. And I remember going, what, what is wrong with me? Because when I looked at my friends, they seemed so carefree. And yet I just felt like I was in this bad place. I remember sitting down in front of the piano playing sad Michael Bolton ballads from the late 80s. I mean, if that isn't a cry for help, I don't know what is right there. So I was struggling. I went to counselors, and I did start taking uh, Prozac. But at the same time, in conjunction, there was a deep longing in my heart because I was very far from God. And it set me on a course where I began to read, I began to talk to people, I started going to church. And while it didn't change overnight, when I gave my life to Jesus, and I said, I'm yours, things did change for me. There was a new joy. There was a new hope that came into my life. Until we are right with God... Our our mental health will never be quite right. So the big question is, and and, and Anna shared a little bit of this, well, what if you are a Christian? What what do you do when when you have anxiety or a sense of, of, of hopelessness at times? Or maybe you are just in a season of depression. I wonder sometimes if the reason why we are sad that the hope and the peace or the joy that seems to have left us, whereby we are beginning to even ask, like, am I even a Christian? Like, what's wrong with me? I I, I should be happier, and I I should be growing, and yet I'm not, and I'm stagnant, so I'm starting to, I'm concerned about that. That perhaps what you're doing is in those dark moments, in those times, anxious times, that we actually could can be compounding the problem by saying, I shouldn't be this way, thereby now instead of just having some depression, you're more depressed because you're depressed that you're depressed. Or that you're anxious more and it's compounded because you, you, you have seasons of anxiety, now you're more anxious because you're anxious. But could it be 
as we have heard the theme all throughout the service, that God, the Spirit, could be working on you. And that part of the path of joy is coupled with those seasons of sadness. This was captured brilliantly in the cinematic masterpiece, Inside Out, the Pixar movie. Have you seen it? Anyway, it's a little girl, and she has emotions. And her emotions of joy, sadness, anger, and disgust, they're personified. And they show these characters having these interactions. And, and then they show the girl and what she's going through. And there's joy, and she's bouncy and exuberant. And, and she's always trying to ignore or suppress sadness. It's like the sadness is not meant to have a voice. But as the story goes, sorry, spoiler alert, the only way they can get home is together. The only way they can manage to arrive where they want to be is when joy and sadness work together. And so it it is with the Christian life. Before we can at times experience those seasons of joy and freedom, we do have to walk through that path the shadow of death, the, 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 the ashy moments before we get to the places of beauty where our character is developed. How many of us have grown, right? How many of us have, have come out the other side of a very dark season and you're different? Part of the Christian life is embracing both of those things. Joy and sadness go together. They are co-laborers in the Christian heart. What's the Bible's answer to this? If if you're wondering, maybe right now you're in a season of of darkness, and you're going, okay, so okay, so you've acknowledged that. So so now now what do we do about that? Romans 8:15 says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Can I ask you a question? What do you think about when you think of your life as a Christian? If someone were to ask you, so what does it mean? So talk to me about what it means to be a Christian. What is it? May I submit to you the answer in a very short, punchy way. You are a child of God on your way to glory. You are God's child adopted into his family, and you are on the road to heaven. So you you are going to encounter God face to face one day. So whatever is going on in your life, painful circumstances, hearts that betray you, depression, anxiety, none of that can take away from this fact. You are his child and you are headed for glory. That will happen. Nothing will thwart that. God says it's done if you are mine. Whom I have justified, I will also glorify. You are heading to glory. 1 John chapter 3 says, beloved children. You know, when, when you hear someone talk to you that way, you, you are beloved. And what you are has not yet appeared for you will see him. And when you see him, you will be like him for you will see him as he is. In other words, you're going to meet Jesus face to face. All the pain, all the mental anguish, all the challenges will be gone. And you will be all that God will make you to be, and it will be glorious. And then it says, everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. I'm not, it's not just talking about sexual purity. It is that we need to set our minds on the reality that we are God's children on the way to glory. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to say this. He said, have you ever wondered that maybe human beings listen to ourselves more than speak to ourselves? So we listen to those voices. 
the internal voices, the self-condemning voices. We listen to the troubling thoughts in the news that come upon us through various means that are all around us. He says, if you ever wonder that maybe you should stop listening to yourself and start speaking to yourself. If you woke up every single day and said, I am God's child and I am on the way to glory and really believe that, you can weather all kinds of storms if that's in your heart. If you begin to speak to yourself that way, that's what hope is. Hope is not sentimental, it's not sweet, it is gritty, and it is tough. Because it is saying, I, don't, I know I'm going through hell right now, but I believe something is coming. And one day, I'm going to see him face to face. I can weather this storm. Our Christian lives are not just about doing Christian things, and minding our P's and Q's, that is not enough to live for. But it is something to live for when you know you're going to meet your Savior. And that doesn't mean huddling in a holy huddle all the time. When I say you are a child headed for glory, I'm saying tell that to the, your friends at the church Tell, them, tell it to them in their small group when they're suffering. And then take as many people along with you as you can in this life. That's what evangelism and mission is. When I hear these stories of this Ukrainian pastor who is facing real problems and he wakes up in the middle of the night laughing, that is a man who understands what hope is. He gets it. And obviously he's giving praise to God. It's nothing in him He's just acknowledging that God's grace is, is so upon him and his church that they're weathering this awful storm. And you know, we can too. Our mental health does not have the final voice. It doesn't have the final word in our lives. We, we could pull any character from the Bible. Take Abraham. This is what Abraham, this is what it says about him. In hope, Romans 8, uh, 4.18. In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah, Sarah's womb. This is a man who had a lot of difficulties no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith and he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. And then in Hebrews 11, 9 and 10, it says, by faith he went to live in the land of promise in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. There is a greater city. There is a promised land for the people of God. We have an inflated view of what the world can give us. And we have, frankly, a very deflated view of what the future holds in glory. Friends, set our hope. Set your hope. You are a child of God headed for glory. The battle isn't simply what's going on in your head, your heart, your thinking, or what's going on in your circumstances, as troubling as they may be. The battle is, do you believe this? Are you hoping in this? Do you hold on to the truth that you are a child of God headed for glory? There was a, uh, a movie, um, Russell Crowe, A Beautiful Mind. It was 2001. And in the story, it's a story of John Nash. He's this brilliant mathematician. He's an economist. And he is approached, in the movie, he's approached by these spies. And they're asking him can, if he can decode this thing going on with the, with the Soviet Union at the time. And so he's, he's doing all of these things. And he's, 
he's, he's getting pursued, and he's running away, and he's finding letters in his mailbox, and he's trying to decode these things. Well, as the story goes, sorry, um, another spoiler alert. It's all fake. It's completely in his mind. You find out later in the movie that he's suffering from schizophrenia. And as a result, he, he finds a path whereby he gets healthy because he had to take some medication, but then that was messing with him too much. So but he found a path where he could, he could walk in life dealing with some of those things that are going on in his brain. And at the end scene, he's older, and he's, he's actually functioning quite well in life. And he's, he has a young lady come up to him and talk to him, and at one point he leans in and goes, are you real? And she's like, yeah, okay, just checking, just checking. When we hope in God, we are training ourselves to not live by the hallucinations of our broken mental health. Wherever we find ourselves on that spectrum, whether you've never suffered depression in your life, occasional anxiety, all the way down the the spectrum. We're going to come for communion now. Thank you so much for waiting and for listening to the whole video. I hope that provided some food for thought. It's just a conversation starter. And so one of the things I just wanted to close with, I'm a nurse practitioner and I worked for close to 50 years as a nurse. And I have never, ever had a cancer patient say, just end it, just Just give me the overdose, just end it. I can't take the pain. But what do you see in every suicide note? Finally, the pain will be over. I would submit to you that none of us really, really understand the pain and anguish going on with people who are struggling. And so I would appeal to you, like Alan said last week, that we be the hands, the feet of Jesus, and we help our brothers and sisters along the journey when sometimes they can't stand up on their own. So in closing, I just want to pray. Father, I thank you for Michelle's heart for inviting me to bring this subject up for discussion. I pray that as each of us goes home, goes on our way for the rest of the week, The Holy Spirit stirs in us what our role might be individually and collectively as a community church family for how we can move forward to better support people, families who are experiencing mental health struggles in a faith-infused way. Lord, we are not counselors. We are not professionals. We are just wanting to hold the hands of our brothers and sisters through their struggles. Inspire us, guide us, and may our hearts and our ears be open to what you are speaking to us. We thank you for being such a loving God, and we thank you for the opportunity to respond to this need. In your name, Jesus Christ, amen.